Derek, man. Thank you so much for coming back on the show here today. Really excited to have you back on. Could you start by just telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me on, Mike. Always great to be uh, talking with you and, and hopefully get in person with you soon. Um, yeah, uh, I guess uh, right now I'm kind of doing consulting work and, and education around uh, sprinting and, uh, you know, anything to do with running and sprinting. So um, that's what I've been focusing on. And uh, other than that, just training my kids. So yeah, uh, th that seems to be my focus now is, is being a good parent and just trying to spread uh, whatever I've learned over the last 30 years. I love it. I love it. And what's new since the last time we talked? Obviously, the consulting is going well. You know, anything else uh, yeah. new and exciting in your world? Um, I, I've, I've been doing a little bit of work with uh, some force plate stuff, and I'm not a force plate guy, but um, there, there's a few projects I'm working on to correlate um, some jump types and, and different contact types to actual sprinting. So Ooh. I'm hoping to have some sort of course around that because I know a lot of people have the force plates, Yeah, but I don't know if they use them for the running piece and, and doing some comparisons there. So I'll, I'll, I'll have more on that uh, in the next few months. Oh, you got to fill me in on that. Cause yeah, we've got, we've got some plates and you know, I want to get some timing gates so we can like start putting some of these pieces together. So yeah, it gets very out, I'd love to see it, dude. I'd love to yeah, see it. Absolutely. Okay. Well, man, you know, the reason you're here, I, we got to talk Achilles training and Achilles issues because you wrote what I described as your magnum opus. <laughs> it's like a 6,500 word article on this topic. I'll make sure I link to it in the show notes. But just for starters, what got you interested in this topic? Because I know you've been talking about it for a few years now, but like what really got you interested in this? Uh, there's a couple of things. And, and one is if you're a middle-aged male, <laughs> who, <laughs> who, who this is our support group here. Right. Um, if, if you're doing any sort of training yourself or demonstrating, um, and that I do a lot of stuff where I go and teach courses in person and I have very excited, uh, attendees who, and, and I want to show, I want to demonstrate a bit cause I want to show that I'm competent, but at the same time, you know, I, I want to sort of set the tone and say, this is what we're going to do. So I'll do drills. I'll do accelerations. I'll do resisted accelerations. I might do some jumps and the whole time I'm thinking, don't blow your Achilles, right? Because <laughs> right. we're, we're in that high risk group. Um, so that that's one of the reasons I'm always conscious of it because if you've, and then there, there was a case where I was working with some people and, and somebody um, uh, tore their Achilles and it was very loud and dramatic. And then there it kind of froze me on the spot and I started walking very softly after that event. And, right. and, and it's, it's not a pleasant thing to experience, even as a, a bystander. Um, and then on top of that, uh, you'll see that in a lot of professional sports and even at the younger ages, uh, we're seeing a higher incidence of this injury when, uh, you and I probably thought it was an old guy injury. Like, Oh, okay. This guy's in his, you know, 15 years in the NFL and he stepped funny and he tore his Achilles. Well, that's, that's kind of the minority of cases now. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a younger population, and so I'm wondering, well, why is that? And then we get into all the other factors. Is it like the, the surface? Is it the shoes? Is it, you know, so we can talk a bit about that. But that's, I, I, I think that's one of the reasons that, that I got involved was that it seems like it's something that's very present, um, not just for the older population. And I, I'm obviously very concerned for myself. And, and now I have to be concerned for my kids. Like what kind of, training am I going to give them? How do I prepare them? Yes. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a pretty serious injury. We know that it affects people beyond the injury in terms of their, um, you know, their careers. So, you know, whereas maybe an ACL is, is something that's more recoverable from at this yeah. point. So, yeah. Okay. I love that, man. Okay. So again, if you haven't read this article, I'm going to link to it in the show notes, make sure you either do it pause it now and read the article or go back and listen to it after the fact. But there's two numbers in that article and like references that, that you cite that are very interesting. The first one was that you mentioned a study from Finland and you reported that there's a 10 X increase in Achilles ruptures over the past 30 years, which is mind blowing to think about. But then number two, 
you would think with all of our sports science, all the technology, all the information we have about training that cases in sports like the NFL would be going down. But you, you mentioned in the NFL that actually from 1980 to 2001, they averaged, the league averaged four Achilles tears a year. And the last three years, we're seeing close to 17 Achilles ruptures per year. So what do you think is going on here, man? <laughs> I mean, those, those are yeah. mind blowing numbers when you, when you step back and think about it. Yeah, especially when we look back to the, you know, the 80s, the 70s, 80s and 90s and and we think, "Whoa, that was like rough and tough NFL and there was right. no there were no guidelines, right?" Is especially when it comes to things like concussions and and then we think of like astroturf being this horrible mm-hmm. thing. Um so all of the conditions seem to be ripe for them to have more. And now that we have all this science, um for some reason, we have more now, and, and right. it, it's it's a bit disturbing. And, but I think a lot of the time, you know how it is in pro sport, everybody kind of passes it off as, well, that's the cost of doing business, and this is, you know, we're faster and stronger, and and that's why. Well, if, well, if we're stronger, how come this is still happening? So, I, I there's there's obviously a lot of reasons why this is happening, um, and and I think one of the main reasons like and i don't know if i really um you know drive this home in the article but certainly it's all about time and i think any injury right now is all about time it's about how much time are you putting into your preparation and how much time is being squeezed by other things and maybe some of that squeezing is being done by the sports scientists inadvertently like hey We have to do this. We have to do, you know, this testing and we have to do this activity as part of recovery. Um, And we have to do, you know, we have to go talk to the sports psychologist and you have to do this and do that. And then, you know, and then the coaches want to do more too, right? Whether it's film or walkthrough and, but you're squeezing out potential for doing activities that will help prevent these things. Like if, if, I mean, you know, if, if you talk to a strength and conditioning coach in pro sport, what is their main gripe? They don't have enough they, time. They don't get to do anything, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, hey, you get a uh, 20-minute uh, strength and conditioning session two times per week, right, in season. Maybe that, right? right? And then as soon as you start squeezing that, then players start to think, well, I guess it's not important. Right? So right. If, str- if strength and conditioning is the least important thing on the plate, for uh, the organization and and they're not doing that on purpose, but inadvertently they're, they're squeezing it out. Then when it comes to the off season, the players thinking, well, I got to do more sports specific things because that's all they care about. I got to run my routes. I've got to, you know, whatever catch, you know, with the jugs machine or whatever. Yeah. Um, But they're not thinking about this gradual approach to your fitness and developing some sort of foundational strength, so that you can last for however many games it is now, 17, 18, whatever it's going to be. Um, So I I think that if you're reading the article, that if you can pull that from from the information there, I think that's the most important thing. And even the simple thing, like you had mentioned, um, younger players are being exposed to more injuries now when we thought it was an old person injury. Well, guess what those younger players are doing? Well, they have to show up a little earlier for rookie camp. So they're doing more specific stuff than the vets who can kind of come in a little more gradually. And there's much more competition amongst these younger guys. So there, there's there's lots of different factors that I think relate to the time of preparation. Yeah. It's so interesting because I think that was really eye-opening for me. Like I followed this in the NBA, right? And the the natural tendency is for this to happen, you know, late 20s, early 30s in the NBA. Now, granted, those guys, a lot of times are starting at 18, 19, their professional careers. So they've been in the league for a while. But I think that was really interesting in your article was that there's almost like two camps, like you've got like the older camp, the vets that have been there for a long time. But then you've got this, like, like, mass of 21 to 25 year old guys, whether it's due to more competition, Uh, longer camps or like longer time being around and getting those live reps, you know, there's a camp of like very young guys that are getting injured. And that was really counterintuitive to me. I wouldn't have expected that. Yeah. And and I mentioned in the article, two things, one was early specialization and then just specialization in general. So you have, 
<clears throat> and you see it. <clears throat> All you have to do is watch social media. There'll be um, some clip of some kid who's probably like seven years old with a helmet on <laughs> doing like ladder drills and the, the father's out there making him do all this football specific stuff. Yeah. But you're not seeing, you know, that same kid doing sort of like, you know, a general buildup of general preparatory activities because it's not exciting. Like let's yeah. make, let's put a helmet on him, call him baby Gronk or whatever you want to call him. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what I was thinking of. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And let's make him look like the adult Gronk. And, and, and I think that's part of the problem, that early specialization. Uh, maybe they're not doing football, track, basketball, baseball. Maybe they're just doing football. And, and maybe they're just doing a lot of, if you're a defensive back, uh, well, guess what? You do a lot of backpedaling into breaking the, to the ball. Well, that's really stressful on the Achilles. That's probably the worst thing you could do uh, in repetition. Yeah. Um, and then, okay, Let's get to, they've developed, they've got their scholarship. Well, then it's more spe specialization. Like, you know, we, we've always heard about the athlete. Like there was an MMA fighter uh, recently, a UFC fighter who tore his Achilles, but he was playing basketball, right? So now they're going to say like, well, don't play any other sports. So it's just right. going to be pure specialization. Uh, I'm not saying that MMA athletes should be playing basketball for their prep, but <laughs> but it's just another example of like, hey, stick to what you know and let's just do more of it, um, which which could take things in the other direction. So there, you know, it, it, it there's nothing wrong with specialization. You have to do some of it, and you have to have the skill set, you know, to play your sport. But you have to have somebody come in and say like, okay. Let's do 40% of all your training. Let's be specific. And then the other 60%, let's like kind of broaden things out and make sure you have right. some, you know, foundational strength and, and fitness and, and we're not creating overuse injuries. But I think that's, that's, that's the problem. I, I, I had this opportunity to talk to somebody who was in high up in the NFL, uh, like a VP. And we were talking about the off season. This is at the NFL combine. I knew him through, a. Um, uh, a, a mutual friend, Cody Benz. I don't know if you know Cody. Oh Benz. yeah, of course yeah, I know yeah. Cody. He yeah, entered yeah. at iFast. Yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. right. So Love Cody, Cody uh, was uh, like a personal trainer for this guy. So he said, "Okay, let's uh, hook you up with Derek." So we talked about the NFL off season, and the one thing that he said to me, I said, "Well, you really need to expand the amount of strength and conditioning in the off season so that you know you get this longer exposure." And he said, "Okay, well that's that's good, but." But you can't take anything away from the football coaches. You can't minimize practice like you, the OTAs and all that. The The football coaches must have their time. Yep. And I think that's the problem is if you give it, if you give the decision to the football coaches, they want to do more football. Mm -hmm. But that's not what they necessarily need from a health and preservation, a career preservation point of view. So there's all these competing factors that are making it much more difficult to give them what they need. Yeah. Well, I think that was one of the things I appreciated the most about the article was, you know, look, you and I have both been around long enough to know that like anybody that claims they have the one answer is full of it. Right. Or they're trying to sell you something. And that when you start looking at, in this case, Achilles tears or ACL ruptures, hamstring pulls, when we're talking about any of these types of injuries, it's very multifactorial. It's not like a one size fits all thing. And until you step back and really start to appreciate all the different levels and things that play into this, you're probably not going to be super successful making an impact and making some positive changes with these athletes. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, I mean, it's multifactorial, but I think with the Achilles tendon, I, uh, I, a lot of the studies that I've read and even anecdotally, I was talking to Rob Panarello and he said, I talked to surgeons and whenever they, you know, go in and look at the Achilles tendon after a rupture, they see a lot of fraying and degeneration in the tendon fibers, right? So it's not something that just happens. It's not like this sort of spontaneous thing that happens. There's something happening over time that's setting it up, right? right? So that, and then it goes back to what you were saying. It's, it's multifactorial in that they're not getting the right type of training. They're getting too much of another type of training. Maybe they're in their football cleats too long, right? Yeah. Like if I've ever worked with soccer or, or football, they want they show up in flip flops and then they put on their cleats, right? Right. So right. there's not this transition between different types of shoes and different stiffness of shoes, and a lot of the cleats now are very stiff, as you know, 
um, I was I was doing some work for the Atlanta Braves and they handed me a, a cleat and I couldn't flex it like for baseball. I'm like, I wow. you know, and I assume it's so stiff because when you're hitting and throwing in the dirt, um, they want to compensate for the compliance of the dirt. Right. So they make the shoe really stiff. But for running, it's horrible. Yeah. Um, so so you have all these really stiff, rigid shoes. And if the foot can't flex, where does the stress go? Goes in the Achilles. Right. Right. So it's, it's this long lever and you're trying to load the Achilles more, but there's wear and tear. And then the fields um, themselves are going to be stiffer and tighter because the last Super Bowl, what was <clears throat> the big complaint about the field? Guys yeah, are really. slipping. Yeah. Right. Yep. And then, it, oh, you know, I can't, I can't get after Patrick Mahomes because I'm slipping as I come around <laughs> the corner. And so, okay. So the, the field guy got heck for that. And now we got to make sure that field doesn't have any slipping. So guess what? Let's tighten it up. Let's tighten up. Whether it's turf or grass, you want to have some friction so people don't slip. But what's the other side of that? You don't have any slippage, then there's a lot of stress going through that Achilles again. So, uh, you know, we talked about it. Is it, even with ACLs, is it grass? Is it turf? And it seems to be, it's always about 50, 50. Like if, if 50% of the fields are grass in the NFL and 50% are turf, well, there's an equal amount of injuries on both of those. Yep. Right. So it's, it's, you can, it's an easy, it's an easy thing to blame. And I understand that the players are going, well, I feel it a little more in my joints when I'm on the turf uh, and my, my muscles and tendons, but that's, you know, that feeling it and, and, creating or, or, or saying that that's the cause are two different things. And, and uh, one of the, the experts, I was at the PFATS conference, the medical summit in March. And one of the guys they brought out was like a field and turf expert for the NFL. And he said, uh, there's 30 different fields in the NFL. That's all I'm going to say. It doesn't matter if it's turf or grass. Every field is different. Right. And I think at Tennessee, they replaced a turf field or grass field with turf, which is counterintuitive. They're like, they said, no, nope, this grass field is getting mucked up because we got, I don't know, tractor pulls and concerts and, <laughs> sure. and it get, you know, it, 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 it compresses it in some areas and other areas it's, it's probably all muddy. And so it's inconsistent. And I think that inconsistency drives a lot of injuries where you don't know what your footing is going to be like and your brain, you know, gets confused. So they're going to make it a uniform turf field now because they had so many injuries on the grass. Right. right. And then other people are going to ch- turn their grass field into turf. And then you have these indoor fields um, like Vegas and Arizona where they grow it outside and then bring it in. But then there's right. some problems there with the root system. And <clears throat> it's not really natural grass. It's sort of like, you know, um, you know, some guy in his basement growing weed. Right. Like it's not real. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's artificial. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's funny. Uh, um <laughs> Great analogy, dude. Yeah, Great analogy. Yeah. I'm, I'm, from, I'm from Vancouver, British Columbia, so I, <laughs> they do that a lot here, I guess. Um, but, you know, it, it's all of these factors that create confusion around footing. Um, and, and, and you know as well as I do is that if you're on a, on a surface that doesn't seem like, you know, it's consistent, your body reacts in a certain way. So, yes. um, you know, so, it, you know, being on inconsistent services, having to adjust, too stiff, too soft. Well, that has an effect on your tendons and how they sense because, you know, the tendons are loaded up with different receptors yep. and, and they try to anticipate how to respond. So if they don't know how to respond, well, you're going to get wear and tear, wear and tear. And then at some point it's going to blow. So yeah. it's, I, I, it's stressful. I would think if I was involved with the team full time and I, I knew, I mean, Ignorance is bliss, right? Because if you know all of these things are a problem, you're just going to go nuts. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I want to circle back on a specific topic that I found very interesting. So again, they've done research in the NBA. Uh, I'll link to the the research article is by like Adam Petaway, Matt Jordan. They basically went in retroactively, got game film of guys that tore their Achilles in NBA games. There's a very specific mechanism, right? Um, Some people would call it a false step. Lee Taft would call it a plyo step. But literally in almost every case, it happens where it's like this explosive step back, too much probably tissue yielding, right? They hit full dorsiflexion and the Achilles tears. 
But one thing you mentioned that I thought was really interesting is this increase in incidents in defensive players versus offensive ones, right? And it makes sense, right? So I'm thinking about a defensive back going back, backpedaling hard, planting and going, same mechanism, uh, maybe in defensive linemen as well. So could you talk to that a little bit, why you maybe think we see it more in defensive players versus offensive players? Yeah, it's it's like you said, it's kind of intuitive. You're like, okay, somebody's retreating um, or yielding um, initially, and then they want to go forward. So that's that rapid stretch. And you'll see it, uh, you know, the, the ball of the foot hits the ground, and then is there a lot of heel travel to stretch that Achilles before it goes, right? Yep. Whereas if you landed flat-footed, typically not a problem, but it's that ball of the foot, uh, like you said, it's a, a, a plantar flexion and then heel travel to stretch the Achilles. And if that's happening a lot and it's happening violently, so ba- like you said, backpedal to break, very common. Or you're a D lineman and you know the O-line's coming at you for a run play and you're yielding and you're stepping back you know, trying to drive them forward. So that's, and then the other one I think that they mentioned was that if you're a defensive end and there's sort of a a curved run and you're torquing and there's like this asymmetry in terms of the stress through the Achilles, that's a problem too. Um, So, and, and, and the the Achilles always seems to go at the thinnest point. And I think they said like two to six centimeters above the calcaneus. So it's the thinnest point where it's going to go. So if you're wear and tear back and forth as a defensive player, and you're on a very stiff surface that doesn't s- slide or slip a little bit, it's driving all that force into that tendon. The other part of it is they're saying it's more of a reactive injury. It's not like, so if you're an offensive player, you kind of know where you're going so you can plan. Right. The predictability of it. Yes. Yeah. If, if it's unplanned and you're reacting, then you can't, you can't draw on as many resources to, to help, you know, you know, lessen the blow or, or create motor unit recruitment right yeah. around that to prepare you. So now it all goes into the connective tissue and joints. So I think uh, those are the two factors um, because again, they've lo- again, looked at turf, they've looked at temperature, they've looked at uh, weather and all these things. And there, there's not a clear uh, division there between, um, you know, having Achilles tear and not having one, but, but certainly defensive players, more um, age, seems to be younger players because they're fighting and competing. Right. Um, and they probably get more reps yeah. Uh, because, you know, they're younger and they're having to show their, their stuff. So, yeah, but, but that, that's the one thing. And I think in basketball, like you said, it, it's some sort of reactive step or loading step yep. before something explosive happens. Yep. Um, and, 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 and sometimes you'll watch, and you'll like I've seen this in basketball. Where we're like, wow, that didn't look like a very powerful step. But it, it, what happens is again, if they're doing that movement over time, thousands and thousands of times, it's setting it up. And then when the actual event happens, it doesn't have to be this super maximal effort. It just has to be the same stretch. Could be sub maximal, and then it eventually goes. Yeah, yeah. Like you said, there are times where it's probably a max effort event, but there's probably also plenty of times where it's just death by paper cut, right? Yeah. You've done this tens of thousands, hundred thousands of time. And now you've just, like you said, worn out that thinnest part or it's degenerated and then it goes. So yeah, it's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. There was a, I, and I was talking to some, I think I was talking to somebody at a shoe company and it was kind of off the record kind of discussion. And we we're talking about Kobe Bryant when he had his Achilles rupture and there was something around shoe design that we both thought might have precipitated it. And he mm-hmm. wanted he wanted a zero drop shoe for basketball. The okay. reason being that I think maybe Michael Jordan requested this that he wanted it flatter and closer to the ground, right? Right. Um, I don't know if that was mentioned in that Netflix movie when they're making the shoe. What was the, the right with Jordan oh, Air? Air? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, but there was something about the design that he wanted, you know, to be closer to what Michael Jordan had because, you know, maybe it helped his game. But going to a zero drop, if you think about it, say it was like a one centimeter drop before you, your heel was up by about a centimeter more. Well, think about the repetition of that one centimeter every step where you're stretching an extra centimeter. And stuff right. like that made me think. Like maybe it is, like you said, death by a million cuts, right? It's 
it's a very slight change that you're not used to that's going to create that wear and tear and it's going to set you up because it's unfamiliar um yeah so I, i'm you know again going back to shoe design and there's a reason why we have a heel you know a thick thicker heel in the shoe yep. and it's it's not it's not aesthetic it's not it's it's there for a function hmm. interesting well let's go there a little bit because you know one thing i definitely wanted to talk to you about was footwear and we've kind of talked about it a couple of times already but i'm really fascinated by this because you know as athletes right especially in football like i think about the time do you, you know dave tenney right i think yep. that's where we met was that's at right. one of dave tenney's seminars and he would talk about uh the basketball versus the soccer or sorry football versus soccer players, right? Because they played on the same turf. And he's like, the football guys would love it for the first two years because it was stiff and it was strong and they felt fast and explosive and the soccer guys hated it because it felt like they beat them up. And then the next two years, the football guys hated it because they felt slow and sluggish and the soccer guys loved it because they didn't take the pounding. But I thought that was really interesting and it made me think about footwear. And you talked about footwear and how that impacts performance. I mean, is there like a perfect shoe? Is there a perfect kind of footwear um, or, or what maybe a better question would be like, what kind of footwear should we be looking for if we want to play at a high level, but also like maximize our longevity? I, I would say, you know, again, we're getting to this specialization piece where the shoe is, is being created for, you know, running faster. Like I think it's come like from track spikes, the original mm -hmm. track spike, if you, you know, had it, a one from the seventies would be pretty flimsy. It was almost like a slipper with spikes in the bottom. Right. Right. Um, so that you could feel the ground and, and, um, and, 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 and let's be honest, uh, you know, 50 plus years ago, they were running on cinders or dirt. Right. So they needed the traction uh, the dirt didn't really give much back. There wasn't much, uh, energy return from the dirt. And if you watch Jesse Owens run, he seems to run with a lower knee height <clears throat> because he needs to get to the ground quicker and just create more steps to create propulsion. Whereas if you watch Usain Bolt or anybody nowadays, you see it, this higher knee height because they can deliver more force and get return off the ground. Right. Okay. So we want to get return off the ground. So what has happened with the track spike is it's gotten stiffer and stiffer and they've raised the forefoot. Remember like the old strength shoe? Oh yeah. The oh, Walter yeah. Payton strength uh -huh. shoe where they had this big forefoot and you know, I mean that probably led to a lot of problems too, but thank <laughs> goodness we don't, we don't have that anymore, <laughs> but right. you're building up the forefoot and stiffening it so that you can create more travel to load the Achilles tendon and you get more return. So right. there's this performance, impetus for all of the shoe design but the other side of it is if you load that tendon more you're going to have more problems now there you know it's it goes both ways and so now everybody says well that's the fastest track spike let's turn soccer shoes and football cleats yes. into a track spike now because we want them to run faster so now you have probably a shoe that's pretty light pretty stiff Stability wise, I don't know. It's, you know, I've seen some football cleats and, and if, uh, if you had to cut in those, they just don't have the width or, or the structure to be stable. So right. I think, thinks as a shoe designer, they're thinking lighter, faster, stiffer. Right. But that creates a whole bunch of different problems. It'd be like if you're a car designer, right? But at least the government is involved in that so they can regulate how a car is designed. But Guess how you make a car faster, lighter, stiffer, right? Faster, right. more power, right? But right. if everybody had that car, you know, the fatalities and motor vehicle <laughs> accidents would be through the roof, right? right? But we don't have that safeguard, at least not now in, in the NFL or, you know, there, there was an interesting comment too. I think it was the same shoe designer. And he said, the NFL wants us to stiffen all the cleats because they're afraid of turf toe. Well, would you rather have turf toe or a blown Achilles? Right. Right. Yeah. So, you know, so they're, they're worried about something that's, you know, okay. Yeah. You, I don't know how many weeks I, I know you can have serious turf toe, but yeah, it's, it's, you're creating a new problem. It's springing up somewhere out. It's like whack-a-mole, right? Like, oh, we right. saw this one. Another one pops up. So I, I think it's this, and I, I'm not sure about basketball. You know, a lot more about basketball than me, but I don't know if that's happening with basketball shoes. But certainly 
track spikes, uh, cleats. Uh, and again, I'm not sure about the court sports, but I, I'm sure there's some elements of that leaking into other sports where they're trying to make a super shoe. Oh yeah. But yeah. it's, it's, it's creating more problems. Yeah. Well, another topic, cause I'm kind of bouncing around a little bit here that I was really, really intrigued by in this article was the idea or the concept of people blowing their Achilles while they're sprinting, like while they're doing acceleration work, because Okay, in something like basketball, where you are changing direction a lot, where you might backpedal and hit that max Dorsey flex position, or in defense, in football, right? Like, that kind of makes sense to me. But the fact that people are doing this in sprinting, like in acceleration work now, I just, I can't fathom that. So could you talk to me about how this is happening or why you think we might be seeing this now in acceleration type activities? Yeah, I mean, there. Like I think I mentioned in the article, I've been coaching track sprinters for a long time, like three decades. Never had an Achilles tendon rupture. A few cases of like tendonitis, tendinosis type, that type of thing, where they're sore, sure. right? But not exceptionally common. So when I saw in certain, I got, I, there was a couple of video clips where I saw where people went down in the NFL, where they're just coming off you know, starting a route and they just go down. Yep. And then I've heard of other cases in dry land training for ice hockey, um, other sports where people are just sprinting like, Oh, they, how did they tear their Achilles while well, they were sprinting? And so as somebody who advocates for sprinting, I'm a little concerned because now maybe right. people, people might go, well, we're not doing any sprinting <laughs> right? Uh, as part of our training. And so it, it, it goes back to that, that whole idea of one, are they prepared? Like when I would uh, coach track and field, we would probably have six to eight weeks of general preparatory activity of drills, of strength and conditioning in the gym, of maybe doing some work uh, on the beach, maybe doing uh, some drills and jumps on the beach, maybe doing it on a grass surface. Uh, we're never in spikes until like maybe 12 weeks in. So it's this very gradual buildup to get somebody to sprint. It's not yep. like... Hey, let's go sprint, right? Like, hey, we've you know we did our warm up. Let's go sprint. It's it's this you know meticulous way of preparing the tendons and the connective tissue for what we're ultimately going to do, which is a, an all out sprint. So I think that's part of it is you're not having this preparation around getting them to do a very explosive activity. Um, the other part of it is maybe sprinting it was just the straw that broke the camel's back after doing all sure. of these other activities you know the you know the route running and and the backpedaling and all that so and in the ice hockey um example i think it is you know there's not a lot of elastic response work when you're skating there's probably some but there's not this huge heel travel and stretching of the achilles because you're in a, right. a higher boot um, that limits ankle mobility. So when you say, okay, you guys played a whole season of hockey in the off season, we're just going to start with sprinting and yep. we might put a sled on you. So now you have them in this very deep acceleration position where they're getting this heel travel. And if you haven't brought that along gradually, because again, we're all squeezed for time, we got to get four weeks in of sprinting, then you're going to run into problems. So it's, it's the progression piece that's missing. People are impatient. And so we're forcing them into high intensity activities. And, and there's a, there's a bigger piece to that. Like I, I think in the article, I mentioned that there is a vascularization problem. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. okay. You have a poor blood supply to a tissue. What's that going to create? Well, you know, there's going to be less regeneration uh, when things are broken down. So if you, you know, break down a, a, a muscle or tendon through training, you hope that it rebuilds back before you load it up again, right? So right. if you have poor, a poor, poor blood supply, well, you're going to have what they call a necrotizing or, or you know, uh, degenerative situation. So, okay, what's a good way to get a good blood supply into connective tissues? Well, it's probably something that's going to create circulation in your system. So maybe they're not doing as much low intensity aerobic type activity. You never hear about somebody falling down in the New York marathon with an blown <laughs> Achilles, right? Right. Um, so maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe we're not doing 
And, and they're saying that now you should do isometrics, which drives circulation. Which, okay, great. That's part of your well-rounded, you know, general preparatory program. But certainly uh, doing some activities that might have a longer ground contact time, longer amortization phase, uh, stuff in the weight room uh, is going to drive more circulation and strengthen that tendon and thicken that tendon. Yep. So if we're not doing those things and we just say, Hey, let's go do back pedals and do a sprint, or let's just do a linear sprint. What do you think is going to happen? So I think like, again, we go back to this Mac multifactorial cause, but have you really looked at your training and your progressions um, and the div diversity in your training to make sure that all of those tissues are going to be well served and well prepared for what we're ultimately going to do. Yep. No, I love that. I started making notes as, as you were talking and just thinking about some of the things that I keep coming back to. And these are not the only three, but three things that I always come back to in these cases. Number one, just the narrowing of the general athletic base, right? Again, we are both of a certain age now where we can say back when I was a kid, you know, but we see it, right? Kids are out outside playing less. They're playing fewer sports. Their physical literacy is narrowing, if you will. So you got a narrower base to start with. When you're talking about these elite players, the I worry a lot about the continuation of care. Part of that coming from the private side, you know, um, there's not always a lot of... Uh, I don't want to say this. There's always not not always a lot of impetus to go and have a conversation if they're working on the professional level with their strength coach versus that's one of the first things that I want to do is where is this guy at? What are you working on? So it's a smooth continuation of care going back and forth. I think that's an issue. And then I think you've said it very eloquently a couple of times, but just to reiterate, just too much intensity too fast, right? People always want to show, oh, what can we do? Let's, 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 let's get after it today. Let's get the work in versus... Hey man, you just had a long season. Like, let's really just like ramp this up slow. Let's make sure we get a good foundation so that it's not just what can we do today. It's what can we do three months from now? And then ideally, what can you do when you're on the field for your given team? Right? Yeah. Like I, I I'm sure you guys do this because I just know you do, but when you do an intake with a new athlete or somebody that you haven't had a history with, there's two things you want to know. You want to know what have you been doing? Mm-hmm. And what haven't you been doing, right? right. So, <laughs> right, right, because that's important. Because you, they can tell you what they're doing, and it might be, well, I'm doing, you know, I'm doing some Olympic lifts, and I'm doing um, some sports specific stuff. But if they're missing a piece, like we we're talking about, maybe there's a, a, a low intensity circulatory piece, <clears throat> or there's like an eccentric piece, an eccentric loading piece that they're missing. Or there's like, I, I put up this diagram all the time of ground contact time. So sprinting is the shortest and quickest one. And then there's plyos and then there's jogging and, you know, uh, and there's, there's weight room activities. So there's all these different contact time. That's a spectrum. Yeah. And if you're only working in one area, you're deficient in other areas, right? In of, of terms of, of the dynamic uh, involvement of that tendon or that muscle. So, you know, I want to know, have you, are you deficient in this area? Because we need to kind of shore that up because when we send you back to the NBA or the NFL or wherever MLB, we know that you don't have time to work on that or for whatever reason, the forces of competition don't allow you to, to work on that area. Right. If, if it's a, a really a lactic sport, like, like football, Maybe you're lacking in some general conditioning and, and some of these circulatory issues. So I, I think that's what I'm always thinking about. And, and maybe you, you can even talk about that when you guys do an intake. But what are, what are you missing? I need the whole story here so that I can fill in some gaps. We can make you a little bit better here. And, and I think that's the approach that all these private sector people need to take if you're bringing somebody back. Because you see it all the time. Like you said, they get excited. Like, oh, we're going to make you better at this because I think, you know, that's what I'm good at. Right. 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 Absolutely. I mean, I think that's there's there's multiple steps that should go on. Right. It's like there's a, a discussion with the team. What are they doing on your end? What are as a needs analysis on your end? There's an athlete discussion. Right. Where do you feel like you're at? You know, maybe stuff they're not comfortable talking about with the team. 
what is something bothering you? Uh, you know, what do you want to work on for this next year? And then it's an actual physical intake, right? Like putting them through and seeing what they're good at and what they're deficient at. So I think if you want to be successful, you have to do it in a number of different ways. And then, okay, once you feel like you've done your part and you've hopefully tracked and seen some progress, then it's going back to the team at the back end and saying, hey, a lot of, a lot of transparency and, and dropping of egos, I think is what I just keep coming back to. It's like, look, <laughs> you joked around before the show. You're like, I'm just a guy. <laughs> That's kind of where I'm at in this, right? Like, I'm just a guy. Like, I want to help you get better. So tell me where you're at, what we need to work on. And then I'm going to pass you back and hopefully you're in a better state and then they can continue your care and get you to the next level. Yeah, it's uh, like my wife likes watching like Law and Order and then <laughs> she made me watch like the Lincoln Lawyer series. Mm, okay. And uh, and I'm like, ah, oh, geez. But it was actually quite good because, you know, they have a case. Oh, somebody committed a crime and then they got to work back and find all the witnesses and find all the evidence. And, and it's like, that's kind of what we do, right? Yeah, absolutely. It, because you can't just take it at face value. You you can't just watch the video of the guy getting injured and solve it right there. You need to know the history. You need to know the context. And you need to know everybody was involved and talk to them and find out um, what you need to do as part of the rehab so that this doesn't happen again. It's like a detective yep. thing, right? So, um, you know, and, and, and then the article... Uh, one of the areas where, again, I'm not an expert in any, a lot of these things, but I just kind of observing, but there were a lot of information about things that people could take pharmaceuticals um, that might be a contributor to what's happening. Yeah. So, okay. So I'm a college gymnast and I have uh, some Achilles pain. Well, is a cortisone shot the best thing for that? Right. Or is it going to eat away the tissue and create a problem for rupture? Um, and then there were some antibiotics uh, that I think are used a lot during flu season um, that can that they said that actually creates lesions on tendons. Oh <laughs> it's gosh. like, oh, dang. Wow. You know, I think I'd rather just have the flu. But um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah. And, and then, you know, you get into, uh, um, uh, you know, anabolic steroids and things and um you know, that's, that's a lot of time you'll see that where a guy goes down with Achilles tendon. Oh, that guy's a steroid abuser. Right. Well, why? Well, you know, is it the steroids are deteriorating the tendon or do a lot of steroid users also use cortisone and other things that may be creating the problem? Um, are the muscles building too strong for the tendons and they're not sure. growing uh, at a, a similar rate? So, uh, you know, that's part of that detective piece. And then I, I was looking at nutrition and I'm not a nutrition expert by any means. Um, as, as a middle-aged man, the only way I can stay from getting fat is not eating. So <laughs> <laughs> I can't out-exercise my appetite. So I'm like, okay, yeah. you know, <laughs> intermittent fasting, whatever. Yeah. Right. Um, but, you know, there there's some studies that might say that excessive alcohol use and then it's just like bad behavior, right? All around. Right. Um, and then you should probably be taking some collagen and vitamin C. Uh, yep. From what I understand, and, and eating lots of Jello. Um, <laughs> yes, the gelatin. Yeah, but, gelatin. Yep. But it doesn't matter. Like if you're not doing the proper training, it doesn't matter if you're doing all these other things, right? It's it's this idea that, well, I'm just gonna you know, knock back my Knox gelatin and I'll be fine. It's like, well, you're still doing like thousands of reps of backpedaling in those stiff shoes. Solve that right. too. Right. Exactly. Okay. One other topic I want to broach. And then I want to talk a little bit of like training and that sort of thing to wrap up. So you and I both know, cause we both rehabbed injuries with athletes over the years. Like you can come back from stuff kind of quick, right? Like not saying it's the best case scenario, but you'll see people that come back, you know, six to nine months, uh, six months for an ACL nine to 12 for an Achilles. But you and I also both know that it's very rare that well, it just doesn't happen. Nobody's 100% in those windows, right? Like, it's really 18 to 24 months when any athlete that's had an ACL or an Achilles says, no, I'm 100%. I feel like I, I can go out and play at my highest level. So you introduced this terminology, and I absolutely love it. You call it uh, the exposed window, right? So it's that time when they're back practicing and they're back playing, but they're not 100% yet. Could you talk to me a little bit about that and why we need to be more cautious during those periods? Yeah, there, there's 
Uh, I think there was a story that came out recently, and it was one of the Washington Commanders uh, defensive players, and he came back and said, after two years since my ACL, I finally feel like I have the power and the, the output that I had before the injury. So two years now seems to be more the standard, and I, I tweeted at uh, Dr. Tim Hewitt, who researches in these areas, um, and he says, yeah, that, you know, from a physical, psychological, um, you know, just general function point of view and confidence, it's probably about two years now for a lot of these injuries. Um, so then to your point, okay, like I've, I, I've been involved in ACL rehabs where I, I got them running back after, you know, 10 weeks and, and doing things. And the whole point of getting them back quicker to, to those activities is now you have a longer window to actually train them like a normal athlete. Right. So the longer that you put off that, that progression back to training and you kind of soft shoeing it and you're like, okay, no running until, you know, I've had cases where people haven't really done any running or sprinting and it's been five, six months after an ACL. And so now we're in the hole. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and, and the other part of it is, okay, well, what's happening with the two legs? You have one where you've had surgery and you have one who didn't. So I think in the article, we talk about the contralateral limb getting injured shortly after, right? So there's a high incidence of you've torn your ACL or Achilles on one side, you could very well do it on the other side within the next couple of years, because guess what? You're shifting responsibility to that leg and overloading it. And so now as, as a coach, as a, a sports med practitioner, you have to make sure that they're not listing to one side. And I know uh, Matt Jordan has done a lot of uh, force plate work showing, you know, what that deficit could be or what it should be. And it shouldn't be, I think it's about 20% is this the breaking point. But you want that to be as close as possible when they're doing their sprinting, their change of direction, their squatting, are the hips shifting or are they shifting away from the surgical side? And as you said, that could take a couple of years until there's a normal distribution of force on both sides for every yeah. activity. Like in the weight room, it's easier. Like we can Absolutely. think about it and we can make sure and we can see in the mirror or we can do it on force plates. But when you're in practice, we don't it's not know. The same. Yeah. Yeah. It's not um, so maybe there has to be a much more graduated return to these, I would say, unplanned activities like practice and games and you keep them in this longer stream of controlled activities so that you know that you have symmetrical loading. Um, and from a biomechanical point of view, a coach like you is watching them and making sure that there's not a problem on one side versus the other. And, um, you know, that's, that's what I'm thinking about all the time now is, okay, has there been enough time before we expose them to full practice loads? And yeah, uh, especially for Achilles and ACLs where, if you have to go, for, uh, and I, th I think about this all the time. So if I ruptured my Achilles, I would go for non-surgical, but some of that's because I'm older. And <laughs> right. I, if you've actually seen on YouTube, an Achilles uh, surgery where they reattach, it's, it's disgusting, right? Like slice you open, open it up, right. reattach everything. And I've had a lot of friends now who've had non-surgical and it's gone quite well. I have a friend who operates a parkour facility and He's in his thirties and he still jumps off of buildings and does, and he had non-surgical and he's had no problems. So how does that even work? The non-surgical? Yeah. It's, uh, basically, I guess if they deem it, uh, appropriate, uh, again, you have to talk to your, your surgeon, uh, they basically put you in a very plantar flex position so that when you're plantar flex, the two ends can rejoin and fuse naturally and, mm. and scar down. So Interesting. It, it's, it's much more popular now. But I'm thinking for somebody who doesn't have to get back quick, you know, I think the time to return is about the same. But I think psychologically, some people like to know that that's been reattached mechanically and properly sure. Uh, sure. before they return. But if you have, you know, time and you want to, you know, really work on your rehab, the non-surgical is not a bad option either. And you think mm. about it. Well, OK, if if you don't want to go under general anesthetic, if you don't want to. um be exposed to potential infection. Yeah. 
for sure. Not, it's not a bad option. So I would I would say to anybody who's listening, if if you're uh, a candidate for um, you know if you've ruptured your Achilles, I would look into both and and see if you could get some good information on both. Hmm. But I can see if you're you know wanting to get back into the NFL or the NBA, you're probably going to get the surgery as soon as possible. For sure. Okay. So, so I realize this is a massive topic, and what I don't want people that are listening to this show to walk away with is just this feeling of doom and gloom, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, because uh, it's Be a afraid. downer, right? And yeah. Anytime you talk about a major injury, it can seem scary or overwhelming. Uh, so what I would like to hear from you is just general training thoughts. Like if you wanted to put together just like a really foundational, well-rounded Achilles health program, what would you include in it? Yeah, well, it's it's one of those things where you have to kind of let the pendulum swing both ways, where on the one hand, you should be kind of cautious, right, in, tr in terms of your activity selection. Like uh, one thing in the papers that I found was that, you know, general population has more Achilles ruptures too. It's not just the NFL. It's everybody has more exposure to Achilles ruptures. Why? Well, more people are getting involved in, in you know, activities and whether it's... Uh, you know, training activities or recreational sports, I think there's been an uptick of people doing more things, which is not a bad thing. Having said that, uh, we talk about acute versus chronic loads. And, you know, do you want to jump into going to play touch fo football with your buddies uh, when you know everybody hasn't trained? Probably not. That's a risk factor. <laughs> so this whole progression idea. So you, you have to think about a training program that is going to have progression uh, it's going to have some diversity in terms of different types of loading. But the other part of it is you might have to get specific. So one of the things that I've always used for uh, return after Achilles rupture is we get back into dynamic activity as soon as possible, right? Uh, there was a case where we had a, a guy who, as soon as we pulled him out of the boot, we had him doing very low amplitude running high, running A's, right? Like just yeah. sort of, you know, and, and things that I controlled for was I don't want you too high up on the ball of your foot. I want you to be more midfoot and I want a little bit of travel. So there's a little, you know, a little bit of stretch in that Achilles because that's right. going to help strengthen it. Right. But right. if you're if you're doing you know, up on the toes and your heels like sweeping down, sure. probably not so good. So little micro plyometrics, little uh, running drills that allow you to work on that elastic response and strengthen the tendon. So there has to, you have to expose yourself to that specific stress. Um, do we go into backpedaling right away? No, no. Like I had a, a case, it's um, a player who plays safety at Wake Forest and he had some uh, foot fracture issues. And part of the problem was, is he refractured it a couple of times because it was this sort of like, put him in the alter G, keep him in the pool. Okay, he's cleared. Let's go let him go do Absolutely. some football yes. drills, right? There's no progression. Yes. Yeah. And everybody thinks the alter G treadmill is like this panacea of like safe running. But the problem is it's protected running. It's like <laughs> right. if, if the guy was going to play NFL football on the moon, you're ready, right? We've right. alter g <laughs> you for the moon. But he's not. He's playing with normal gravity, right? So we don't want to alter gravity. We want to experience gravity. And so that, that's been a huge problem is that you have to get people back to the stress that created the problem, but you do it in a managed way where the volume is, is manageable and maybe the intensity is manageable. And then you build, 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 build. It's one brick at a time. And right. I, like we talked about before, people are impatient and they don't want to go through these progressions. So even as a general fitness person, like right now, if I explain to you what I do for, for my health and fitness and, and training, it's going to look like this very broad general preparatory uh, thing. There's not a lot of high intensity activities, but there's a little bit here and there because I know I have to do it as a, a, somebody in their 50s if I want to be safe to do other things. But I'm doing like high repetitions. I'm doing low repetitions. I'm doing little jumps. I'm doing some low intensity running. I'm doing some isometrics, some eccentrics. Like I'm spreading it all around so that I know that I'm protected. And, um, right. you know, it's like the... Uh, the Iocane powder in the Princess Bride, right? Like I'm going to develop immunity by having little amounts of it over time so that I yeah. am immune to the poison, right? But I'm not, you know, knocking it back, right? 
So I think that's that's the biggest you know, training prescription, which probably doesn't differ at all from anything you guys do because it's common sense. It's, right. you know, we're not going to do it. We're not going to rush into anything. Like as Elvis said, fools rush in, right? So right. we're going to take our time and we're going to build, build, build. And then let's get more specific. Let's get more specific, but still have a maintenance uh, of all of these other qualities while we're getting specific. You don't just drop all those things. And that's the thing I learned from Charlie Francis was, Yep. Nothing ever is taken out completely. You always have everything in your program. You just vary the amounts. Yes. Right. And so if, if, if you're doing that, then you're doing a good job and, and you're not, you're not getting rid of anything. You're, you're, you're kind of, you're not hoarding, but certainly you're right. keeping everything in front of you so that you can manage the athlete and bring things up and make sure and, and accidents are going to happen. Sure. So do you sure. freak out and you abandon the training program? No. You, you do the law and order thing and you figure out, okay, well, you know, what do we have to, to change a bit? And, and, and that's, that's really what I've, I've learned over time. Like my, my son, who's uh, doing some track sprinting now, um, we kind of, he was playing football. Then we figured, okay, let's get him to do track. So we had the national championships coming up, Canadian championships. And I'm like, well, we got to do the two minute drill of training and force him back into doing like longer sprints. Cause he was doing tens, twenties, thirties, forties for football. Sure. Now I have to get him to do sixties, eighties, one twenties, 150s, two hundreds. And so I tried to shovel that in pretty quick. Cause I needed those endurance qualities. He re he injured his hamstring, um, 10 days out from the championships and probably a grade one, but still significant. And so, sure. okay, how do I get him back? to run he had to run a 200 meters full out and so we did exactly the same thing every day we did a little bit of work and we just kind of extended it extended it extended it and you know low volume low intensity a little bit higher volume higher intensity and extended it extended it and he ran successfully and no problems with the hamstring 10 days after a pretty significant hamstring pull and it wasn't because i'm a genius it's because i just have a common sense approach organized approach to bringing him back so I would yep. say it's, it's, as you know, it's no different for any other injury. Yeah, no, I love it. And, and I just love the fact that people are still digging for like the secret sauce versus no, it's just like these tried and true foundational principles done right, but over an extended period of time. And you've said it numerous times to reiterate it here, like we're too impatient. We want to have it in a week or in two weeks, or we want to have it, you know, in our Instagram highlight reel versus no, like, let's play the long game here. And that's what I tell all my athletes, like, the program that you get now, if you didn't come and see me for three months, and then you came and saw me a month before camp, you're going to get the same program, right? Because you need to start with those foundational pieces first, like you don't get to skip steps and just go right to the fun stuff. It doesn't work like that. No, it's, it, you know, an example would be like, if you have a topic that you want to learn about something, and you go to YouTube, are you going to pick the uh, 90 minute YouTube version of like that. Like, let's just say I have a plumbing problem, like right. something, something, my toilet broke. I'm not going to watch the 90 minute one, right. but I'm not going to watch the two minute one either. So I'm always trying to right. find, I, I know I've got to put in at least, maybe it's a 12 minute, maybe it's a 15 minute YouTube video. Cause I know there's going to be enough information. So right. I'm kind of saying that with training too, is like, you're looking for that middle ground where you get enough exposure you don't have to be excessive, but at the same time, right. you can't you can't do the instant gratification. TikTok, here's how you fix your toilet. Yeah, just yeah. doesn't work. I wish it did. <laughs> Sometimes that would be nice, right? In two minutes, this is what you do. You're off and running. Well, Derek, this has been amazing, man. Really appreciate your time. I've loved learning from you over the years. Uh, where can my listeners find out more about you and the great work that you're doing? Um. Basically, you can go to sprintcoach.com uh, or runningmechanics.com or my websites. And then on Instagram, it's at Derek M. Hansen or at Running Mechanics. And those are kind of the areas where I just kind of throw stuff up. And, and uh, I'm trying to create more articles for my sprintcoach.com site where the Achilles article is. And just some fresh stuff. I've kind of cleared off uh, all my old stuff and just said, okay, I, I'm, I, I'm going to try to get back to writing more. Cause I think that's a good way to reach people. Me too. I'm glad you're saying that. Cause well, first off, I love the article and it'll be in the show notes, but something I need to do more of as well. It's, 
it's very therapeutic, but it also really helps me kind of take all these thoughts that are in this hot mess of a brain of mine and organize them and make them flow together. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I, I agree. It's, it's one of those things where if you do a quick video, it kind of, it just disappears in your brain. But if you have to actually sit down and write and put, you know, useful thoughts on paper, it does, it does help you too. So anybody out there who wants to get better, just try to write about stuff. Absolutely. I love it, man. Well, Derek, thanks again, dude. This was really amazing. Thanks for having me on, Mike. Always, always a pleasure and always enjoy talking with you.